So it was summer of 2006, and I was sitting in my apartment after another quite meaningless day of work, finding myself what I still do today when I want to distract myself, browsing YouTube. I'm the YouTube guy. So um, I was browsing through YouTube, and the video I came across has accumulated more than 50 million views to this day. Back then, just a couple of thousand, YouTube just started. I'm talking about the amendment speech of Steve Jobs, which he held in 2005 at Stanford when he shared his cancer diagnosis and revealed his greatest life secrets. And I was sitting there, and I remember the words of this exceptional entrepreneur hit me like a ton of bricks. He said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. And then he continued, and most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They already somehow know what you truly want to become. So the next day, I had lunch with my boss, and the conversation went like this. Jochen, I quit. What? When? Um, how about next week? But what do you want to do? I mean, what's the plan? I'm not too sure yet. I will start my own business, not exactly what, but I will follow my heart and intuition. <sighs> um, okay, here's the deal. How about I pay you your salary up until the end of next year, and you give me 5% in whatever you do, and you can keep your laptop. So this was my very first startup funding. No VC involved nothing. But it took me a long time and a pretty disastrous ride to actually understand that following my heart and intuition was only part of the game. So if you were to draw a line of how you want your life to look like between life is great and life sucks, what would it look? Like many young founders, I had the idea I would start off somewhere here and then start my 10-year rich and famous journey up until there. That was the plan, the master plan. But <laughs> in reality, when it kicked in, it looked more like this. So I found myself in endless situations that I didn't desire or liked or nothing like that. And I thought to myself, how does this make sense? You followed your heart, you put everything into it, you followed your intuition, and now you're miserable and broke. I even had to sell my car at a certain point to pay the rent on the street in Berlin. So is this idea of doing what you love and you will never work a day in your life actually true or a big conspiracy? After years of struggling, I figured out that the only thing I wanted to do was to escape my life as a PowerPoint slave and like find a bit more fulfillment in what I did. And I'm not the only one. 80% of us, 80% of us, look for more purpose in their work life and want to work more fulfilled. But although we are looking for it, and that's the biggest dilemma of our time, and we have better technology than ever, we can't find it. In fact, 85% of us, so even more than that, have already quit their job in their mind or work by the book between nine to five. So, as I said, I was struggling again with my, with my business back then, and I had my own company, I started it, and then I found myself in a situation again and was struggling, and I quit my job again. But this time, I left my own company that I started in the meantime. And I can tell you, it felt like jumping ship. I left my people behind. It was one of the hardest decisions of my life. The thought I had in my mind when I left, I thought the only thing I want to do is I just want to work a bit more independently and more free. So I was diving into this world of how digital tools can support remote work and how we can collaborate from anywhere with anyone. And we called it the new way of working. So I went onto that mission to fight against the old world. And um, on that journey, I started a YouTube channel 
um, from like about digital tool hacks from which a podcast arose about this new way of working. And to this day, we published something like 300 YouTube videos and 170 podcast episodes with CEOs, entrepreneurs, scientists, photographers, journalists, students, I don't know, you name it, like everything, always with this one question, like what is this new work and how can it bring more purpose to our work life? So here I was on fire again. And this time I thought, man, now you have the master plan finally. And um, during this time, just the last months and like two years, new work as a term became the latest shit and is still growing like hell in the, in the corporate world. So companies around the world are starting to jump on that topic. <laughs> That's why they start with initiatives like home office, open office spaces, fruit bowls, casual all weekdays instead of just Fridays, um, which are all nice initiatives, but only to make a totally sick work environment a bit more bearable to get from weekend to weekend. And this is not new work, not at all. And I have to admit, I wasn't getting it myself, although I was on fire. In fact, it took me up until episode 100 of our podcast, with, with, which we just recorded at the beginning of this year, to finally get it. Since the energy in the room is different when you meet a person, we always fly to someone to interview them. So for this episode, my podcast partner Michael and I flew to um, Michigan, from Hamburg to Michigan in the States, to interview the man who actually coined the term new work back in the 70s. Quick important side note, our podcast is called On the Way to New Work, not because we're smart asses, but because we were on the way to New York and as usual, I was recording a YouTube video. Being a dyslexic, I made a fortunate spelling mistake, so we ended up with on the way to new work in the subtitles instead of on the way to New York, and so we kind of liked the name and we stuck with it. That's how it started. Anyhow, Friedrich Bergmann is now an 88-year-old philosophy professor, originally from Austria, who invented this term, new work, and that's important, for a work that we really, really want. Because he believes that work can actually become the thing that makes you stronger instead of weaker. And I'm like, okay, I'm sold. I mean, I was looking for this for the last 10 years, I didn't get it, and this guy dedicated his whole life, so I thought, if not he, who else could help me figure it out? So this became a three-hour episode of our podcast that would absolutely change the game. And the background story you have to know is that this guy came to the US through a scholarship which he received for an essay with the title World Which We Want to Live In, which he wrote at 19 years of age in 1949. Just think of that for a second. That's like four years after World War II. 19 years of age, a title, World Which We Want to Live In. I mean, you need balls to do something like that. He then started a variety of jobs, trying things like working as a clerk at the harbor, lumberjack, boxer, in the theater, later working as a lecturer at Princeton while still doing his thesis, writing his thesis. And sitting in this room, I was listening to this man and his story, and I'm like, the question I had, like, how on earth could he keep faith in what he was doing? How was he not afraid with this journey? And the answer was not what I was expecting. It's is geglückt, uh, trotzdem ich jetzt 88 bin. Also, das etwas zu tun, das einem Angst macht. Und eben zu sagen, okay, 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 mach Angst. Schön, gut. Darf dich nicht besonders beeindrucken. Für mich ist der Gedanke, dass etwas einem Angst macht, macht mir keine Angst. Okay, okay. It makes you anxious. Don't get too unsettled. The thought of being afraid does not make me afraid. You shouldn't be afraid of being afraid. That was the first time in my whole life that I understood the distinction between our pre-programmed attitude that we have and the response we can give to a situation. 
See, the, the attitudes and patterns are usually hardwired in our brain, but the response we give to a situation is something we can control. So I now understood why my lifeline was such a mysterious blind flight, since we tend to react out of our primal brain when fear kicks in. You heard of fight or flight? So this fear is very useful in life or death situations. But in everyday life, it can make you get stuck in something we tend to control our comfort zone. But life pushes us all the time through the corners of this comfort zone. And it makes us, it, we, can, we can become static as a result of this fear, and it makes it easy to stay in this comfort zone. But what we tend to overlook, and that's what he said, we tend to overlook the amazing opportunities that can arise when we become the observer of our fear. By simply observing our fear, we're still aware of the fear, but we can act, we can step out of the comfort zone, leading to something that is needed for fulfillment, growth. By taking this one step out of the comfort zone, a whole new world of possibilities unfolds and you grow and gain life experience. I give you one example. I uploaded my first YouTube video in December of 2015 with no filmmaking experience whatsoever. My thoughts being back then, is it okay to upload a YouTube video, especially in, in my industry? Is it good enough? What will people think? What will my mom think? Truth is, nobody cares except for my mom. She, in fact, likes every video I upload, despite the fact that she doesn't speak English, but realistically, some people like it, some people don't, some hate it, some love it. Many others simply don't care. The world keeps turning regardless. But as a result of this one step out of the comfort zone, there came a journey of many more videos being uploaded and published, from that a podcast was born, our biggest clients found us, a company of 30 people has grown, I got asked to hold a TED talk today. So by just taking this one step out of the comfort zone, the comfort zone grows in all directions, not just the one side you stepped out, but to many other sides that you didn't expect. And without fear, we wouldn't be able to feel and push the boundaries of our comfort zones. That's why fear is so important and makes us aware. And then over the course of time, a second revelation became clear to me, quite obvious for other people, but for me it was new. So some videos were better than others. Some were successful, some weren't, and the statistics couldn't tell me why. I was like looking, at, I, don't, I don't know why. And then after a while I realized every time I revealed a little piece of myself, showing my own fear, my vulnerabilities, there were more and more powerful reactions to these videos. And like that, I was able to connect with people on a whole new level, revealing something quite obvious. I may be afraid, but others are afraid as well. And through this connection, I had much more fulfillment in my work life than ever before, leading to something on a personal level, growth on a personal level, far beyond money, or a subscriber count, which I never expected. And then I thought, okay, I'm getting closer to new work, I finally get it, okay, I get the idea, but how do I keep that going? I mean, what do I need to do to keep that going? And I have to be honest here, sometimes I just simply didn't like it. There were certain days when the process sucked, a video tanked, I had a bad day, and I had the feeling I'm gonna quit again. At which point we made, of course, another video about exactly that topic. And while sitting there, and this could have been the last video of that journey, and while sitting there, I was talking, and usually I think through talking. So I was talking, and then it became clear to me. I'm like, it's not difficult to make one video, to hold one talk, to deal with once off critic, to work like one extra day. It was difficult and is difficult to keep that going continuously, all the time. Because you won't like it every day, you better make sure you want it every day. 
And I knew in that moment, I really wanted to make videos and share the message and create. That's what I really, really wanted to do. And this is exactly what Friedrich Bergmann meant with new work. The key difference between doing what you like and doing what you really, really want. So, your willpower helps you to make the necessary decision, to make this uncomfortable decision, to make the next video, to like go over the next day. But it became clear to me that my heart and intuition gave me direction. But it was my willpower that carried me through to where I really, really wanted to go. As I said, making the necessary decision, putting in the extra hour, putting in the extra work. And like this, your willpower makes your comfort zone grow each time you make an uncomfortable decision every day. We tend to think that work should give us purpose, but it's in fact our job to give purpose to our work every day. And if we got this, work can become more than a job and actually the thing that can make us stronger. Thank you. <laughs>